You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 474 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined today by Mr. Seth Miller. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, yeah. it's uh, it looks like spring is going to show up here soon. So, uh, We've been getting our spring floods, so that's always exciting. <laughs> For us, it's like, oh, we get rain and then it'll be like 65 and nice for like a day. And everybody yeah. goes outside. And then the next day, of course, mm. you yeah. know, well, the lawn lakes here are filling up. Ah, very nice. Very nice. Um, you had some follow up from last week on the eclipse flights. What's that Yes, about? we got uh, some feedback from a listener, Aaron, um, who wanted to call attention to a couple things, notably that the Delta flights were out actually added special and Southwest's aren't either. They're just regularly scheduled flights. Um, so I may have misstated that in last week's episode. And also pointed out that uh they're basically flying south to north and the totality is going to be due south so unless the planes file for a deviation somewhere along the way and do a little zigzag you might not see anything anyways gotcha so that'd be interesting but uh if you really 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 want to see an eclipse uh from the air and spend a lot of time in totality uh the best way to do it is on a charter flight that definitely only sells window seats and does some other things actually jsx uh announced a flight that i'm not sure is truly a charter but they're doing it as a giveaway and it's like 12 seats only being sold on one of their 30 seaters so it sounds like not even all the window seats but they're definitely trying to make it as as you know totality as possible for those folks yeah i guess if you have a friend that has a small plane that's the way to do it yeah and you can get to you know the middle of america and follow the path wouldn't uh wouldn't some of the transcons that go kind of southerly also be good options but sit on the right side of the plane yeah, I think the challenge you'd have there is because the path sort of goes from Texas up and across the you know Ohio, and then oh, uh, I gotcha. Whatever yeah. you're, you'll 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 fly through it, but you'll get you'll actually like reduce your time because you're crossing it at the wrong speed. But you might get your minute or so, thirty seconds of interesting. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Long, but yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I discovered that it's actually close enough up here that we've got friends. <laughs> some of my wife's friends are coming to visit to stay with us, so we can try to drive up in a little even further north uh we oh, might nice. not get, yeah we might not get totality here just depends on how far north we're willing to drive um it's about three hours i think is the minimum we'd have to drive to get totality and that's assuming minimal traffic which i can't imagine will be the case on monday yeah yeah Safe, but uh yeah we're gonna try interesting i always find the eclipses to be interesting times like uh when, when we had the one up here just the rentals and the number yeah. of people that we we met who are going to to see it was pretty incredible yeah so yeah. Um, I had some follow up. I mean, I kind of vaguely listened to what Foz said about mediocre Wi Fi. Yeah. And I know Ed commented on it. Um, I guess Foz is pleased with the Wi Fi. Is that the general takeaway? That was the takeaway I got is he see, he thinks it's getting better. I think it depends. I think it depends. I think it depends on the plane that you're on, like the age of the plane and the mm-hmm. type and where you're flying. Um, I, I had a flight from uh, Houston to Portland, which is all over land. Uh, and it, the, the Wi-Fi, I paid the eight bucks. The Wi-Fi didn't work for maybe a half the flight. Um, or it was like loading or whatever. And then it worked. Um, so it kind of, kind of killed, like it was, it was kind of a waste for me. Yeah. But then I've had, I've had flights like over, you know, the Pacific or the Atlantic where it works great the entire time. Um, so I don't know. I, uh, I wish, I wish United would figure out pricing a little bit better. I think they, I think they could do some stuff. I think if it would leave it would relieve flyers if it was don't sell me a day pass for 16 bucks when you know I'm going to be on two connecting flights because that's what the price I'm going to pay anyway. Yeah. Give me, give me some sort of discount, make it into like, make it attractive to be. Yeah. Um, but, and I've long held like, you know, and I can even sort of mention this, I think on the show when we're talking about files, like the guy next to me on my Hawaiian flight was like, wow, this is amazing. It's awesome that it's free, but you know, if it works this well, I pay for it. And Delta actually did a pretty good job of getting people to pay five bucks when they were able to pretty consistently provide the service. Yeah. But you knew it was only going to be five dollars. It was going to work. It was like easy to deal with. Yep. Um, not everybody, obviously, is going to pay that. But if you know it's going to actually work, I think that helps soothe the I guess I can pay for it. Aspect. Yeah. And as, and as an elite flyer, like even even if United said, OK, it's eight bucks for the entire day, any flight you're on for today. Yeah. Like, I pay that. Heck, yeah. I may not even use it on all the flights. But I'd, I'd pay it yeah. because everywhere I go requires a connection. So for me, paying $16 doesn't make a ton of sense. And then on a transatlantic or transpacific, you're charging 40 bucks some yeah. flights. 
That's insane. It's insane. So anyway, way less satellite capacity over the oceans than there is over land. Well, I mean, if we're doing it based on, I mean, I didn't realize, you know, we're, we're pulling a, what is it? Who is it? Wendy's these days. Uh, that's got dynamic pricing. Yeah, exactly. No, no, they, no, Stephen. They were very clear. They're never going to raise prices in high demand times. They're just going to lower them in low demand times to try to induce patterns or induce traffic. They're definitely going to be good to consumers. Don't worry about. Oh, that's that. Yeah, that's how that always works out. Yeah. Okay. All right. New topics. Uh, Batik, Batik. Batik. Uh, they had some pilots that fell asleep uh, during a flight, and uh, those pilots are now suspended. Yeah, and reading this report. Um, not great. Not, not great. <laughs> not great, Bob. Not great, Bob. Uh, the the part where one of them reports like I'm not feeling great, I'm a little tired, and the other pilot's like, "Yeah, go ahead, take a nap on this flight. I got it." <laughs> and then it was like an out. It was like a two a.m. departure for an out and back turn or something like that. Wait, they, they were going to turn back after no, they the did landing? it. They did it out and back for on a oh like, a two a.m. was return. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um. Then I think the incident happened on the return flight of their uh, pairing. So like. We fell asleep, fine, whatever, but it's only one of them. And then the other, the next one, he was like, yeah, I'm still pretty tired. He's like, okay, go ahead, go to sleep. And then the second one, like, called in, re- a re- read back a, a, a navigation change from ATC. Yeah. And 10 seconds later was asleep. <laughs> it's just, I, I respect that. I don't know how to fall asleep that quickly. That's impressive. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm jealous, honestly. I wish I could fall asleep like that. But, I mean, obviously not while working at four in the morning. But... <laughs> Anyway, yeah, it was the write up is interesting. It's like, you know, the pilot had the first pilot who was super tired had plenty of rest, you know, two days off prior, but his family was moving. Mm. And so that impacted it. And, 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 and. but yeah, by the crazy, they ended up off, uh, off course and then reported radio difficulties as the, as the reason. Yeah. Which not listening to nor answering is a difficulty, I suppose, but yeah, I mean, probably not with it. Probably not what that classification is supposed to mean. Staring at the back of your eyelids is a uh, is it the radio difficulty? Yeah. Yes. I I mean we've heard of similar stories, right, where pilots fall asleep or yeah. you know they're playing games or doing whatever. I don't. I mean, there's there's no way to really fix it, right? Like at the end, I mean, unless we had automated planes, which we don't, and we probably won't for a long time. But and shouldn't. And and this is another argument against single pilot operations. I, yeah, I, probably with the caveat that. Some of how I've heard single pilot operations described is basically a control link on the ground so that a pilot or someone else helping to monitor multiple aircraft typically yeah. on the ground would be able to send controls yep. to the plane. So like if the pilot is incapacitated or just asleep, the one on the ground can be like, hey, you should have made a right turn just there and like clickety clack sort of yep. send that command on to the aircraft. Yeah. Um, still sketchy and i don't know that i trust the security and all those other things sufficiently to make that a good idea but yeah, yeah um yeah that's an interesting one there was uh i mean there was a couple so delta pilots or northwest it was a while ago like overflew detroit or something like that right do you remember that yep, i do i do remember it um and i think they went back and found they were like talking scheduling or something and just just totally you know, missed yeah, yeah totally missed you know <laughs> yeah. so hey, that, was our, that was our exit uh yeah, let's check the next one we can loop around it'll be fun yeah exactly um, Air Europa. Let's talk about them. IAG has been trying to scoop them up for a long time, and that seems to be like it's not going to happen again. Well, it's so there's the uh, Europe EU Competition Board uh, has a process it goes through to decide, you know, if divestitures are needed or this or that, right, to approve the transactions from an antitrust kind of perspective, similar to the United States does it. Um, and they have a sort of schedule that they work under and the good news is it's you know pretty clearly scheduled the bad news is if you know you don't meet the schedule like that you're done and so it seems like air europa and iag well we know that they asked to have their schedule suspended mm-hmm. so like hey stop considering us we're still working out some additional details of what we think will be reasonable to offer you um we know that that part happened it's a question now of are they renegotiating price because it turns out air europa is actually making money again Hmm. Uh, which obviously they weren't during COVID and their, their numbers are more impressive than they were expected to be. So that's one factor. Um, or are they reading the tea leaves and realizing that they're going to have to make too many uh, compromises and divestitures to be able to accommodate what uh, the regulators are willing to t- deal with? And hmm. just it's a long and convoluted situation there. But they've asked the regulators to take a, to put them on hold again and let them 
sort some stuff out before they reconsider the deal. I I don't know. I'd be okay if this died, honestly. Like, I do we need consolidation? Especially in Europe? I, I get it. I certainly understand where you're coming from. I think, though, this is, again, you know, we look at the JetBlue Spirit deal, two relatively small airlines that can't compete with the big guys. Um, yeah. It's uh same idea here. I, Air Europa is tiny relative to the IAG, Lufthansa Group, and Air France KLM conglomerates. But, you, I mean, you like you said, they're starting to make money again. It sounds yeah. like, right? I, I feel like they have, like, a... It, it it comes back to this discussion about like growth versus being a healthy airline. Like if they want to grow, sure, okay, join IAG. Yeah. Um, but if you just want to be a healthy airline that's got a niche market that you you serve really well, I, what's wrong with that? I tend to agree. I like to you know, I don't mind being a small business that just does what I do and do it as you know, fairly well. Yeah, fairly well. Um, yeah, you don't have to do it perfect. Right. You know, right. Um. One of the challenges there is there are some economies of scale, especially in aviation, in terms of staffing, uh, acquiring aircraft and components, fuel, uh, and consumers are unsurprisingly uh, unloyal, right? If, if I got to charge 20 bucks more on a flight because I offer that, you know, niche service, whatever, someone else, the, enough passengers aren't going to pay that. And yeah, we, a lot of people say, oh, I would pay extra for the better whatever. And then when the time comes to buy the ticket, they don't. And we see that over and over and over again. Or not enough do. And that makes it hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Um, let's talk a little bit about the NTSB and Boeing and potential criminal charges or criminal investigation. I shouldn't say charges. Criminal investigation. Yeah. Um, they're pissed, the NTSB. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it Jennifer Hamandy? I think is how her name's pronounced. I think, I think so, yeah. Uh, the head testified at a Senate hearing saying... We've been asking for these details basically since the day of the incident with the plug blowout in January, and we haven't gotten them yet. And Boeing has, you know, 60 days later, Boeing hasn't delivered this information to us. And then uh, Boeing issued a statement saying we're cooperating fully and separately had some, and we'll debate how much of this really happened in what way. The, the official story is that their top lobbyist in D.C. had a staffer who sent letters to or emails to senators disputing things and say you know trying to spin it signing this the lobbyist's name he has disavowed that and said his staff wasn't supposed to have done that by basically looking all sorts of terrible try it's the stand the same shit all over again of boeing looking like they're trying to cover things up at the end of the day what appears to have happened is boeing does not have documentation of the door plug being removed hmm. who did it how etc and so that's sort of supposed to be there. Like that's a big part of the requirement. Yeah, the yeah. So that, that's a big problem. Wow. Um, and the, the criminal investigation potential, the DOJ getting involved, the, it seems like it's happening. Uh, what will come from it? Of course, nobody knows, but the Ethiopian 302 crash was like five years and a couple weeks or four years, 50 weeks something like that, 48 weeks. It was very close to five years. Yeah. Uh, and Boeing apparently had a consent decree that basically said, hey, as long as you guys don't screw up anymore, we're not going to press charges. And that expired in mid-January. And mm. this happened a couple days before that expired. So it put Boeing back on the hook, potentially for the original Max problems, plus the new problems, is my understanding. I, I think I got that right. But either way, the DOJ now seems to be... Uh, looking at these things and you know little bits like yes we are an oda right we have de delegation from the faa that we promise we are running our production facilities perfectly and keeping track of all the details on all these aircraft oops we don't have that paperwork uh it becomes a problem in situations like that right because someone somewhere signed off saying we've got all this date we've got all the details on this aircraft as it was built we are confident that it's built to standards and obviously it wasn't and now they don't have the paperwork to explain why what fell through the cracks uh, that's not good, mm. but no, I, yeah, I mean, we're all, I think, act of, oh, yeah, go ahead. no, I was going to say, like, I think, I think they are in a Boeing's in a tough, a very tough spot at this point. Like they, they could really, I don't even know how to describe it. They could really screw themselves. Like, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, yes, the, the challenge there is, and they, they are screwed at this point, right? The FAA has that 
38 airplane a month cap on them until they can sort of get their production line sorted out. They're talking about maybe buying Spirit Aero Systems back, but I'm amusingly that, that Jeffrey is analyst like, I don't think this is a smart investment. Mm-hmm. Well, like dollars and cents, maybe not, but actually keeping the business afloat, probably. Um, also, like, how are you going to fix Spirit that quickly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, guess, I guess the answer there is if it's not an outsourced contract of having to hit a price target per unit that like reports on a top line, if it's, if it gets hidden in the numbers and becomes a little fuzzier, maybe you can make the math work, but yeah. Yeah. It, ultimately, but we're going to have to start paying more to get the work done. Yeah. One course. way or another. And, uh, that's seems to be something they don't want to do because, you know, quarterly profits are king. Well, I, I feel like, I feel like too, there's like every little news story that comes out, like the United flight that ran off the runway and the gear collapsed. Yeah. Right. It, it immediately turns to into a Boeing discussion. Yep. Um, it's about Boeing. And it's like, well, no, that sounds like it was just like a wet runway and the pilot didn't turn the plane when he should have, or, you know, wasn't paying, whatever, whatever the reason it yeah. had nothing to do with the plane. Um, and, and this morning, I mean, I, I, I we should talk about it. Like, there was a incident on a LATAM flight from Sydney to Auckland, um, where the plane dropped in air quotes, I'm putting air quotes up here, like you can see me, but, uh, I mean, it sounds like some kind of, you know, clear air turbulence to me um it sounds like that but latam put out 50 people injured i don't think any seriously but big deal yeah um, was like a lot of people trans tasman so they do a what city to auckland to santiago or something santiago, like that yeah, yeah yeah um so i think it was the short hop of that long trip um in one direction i don't remember which but they claim it was a technical fault yeah but where i'm going where i'm going with this though is this immediately becomes a boeing story well it does especially because they've said it was a technical issue not we had yeah. turbulence, and yeah. that's raised a whole lot of other questions. There's someone posted, I think maybe Harold had it, as noted that there was an issue where if you leave all three uh, computers on, mm-hmm. the uh, navigation computers on board on for like 24 days or 22 days, something like that. Oh, you don't do a reboot. You don't do if they are they stay powered on. You hit two the two to the 31 seconds or something like that. You hit an overflow. Yeah. Of some you know data field. And if all three of them were all powered on at the same time and thus hit that overflow at the same time and all crashed, that's bad. Mm-hmm. I don't have no idea that that's actually what happened, but this is one of the theories that has been posited. And that would be a technical issue. Yeah. Plus an overflow. Yeah. Are really one we know how to mitigate, right? Like yeah. reboot one of those, turn the plane off. And we've known about it for a long time, but also, you know, who designs it that instead of just rolling over, it crashes. Yeah. Why, why was that a good architecture and why wasn't that fixed at some point already? Yeah. So, um, and listen, Airbus has ADs and emergency ADs too. Uh, one came out today that, you know, we talk about not walking into the, we don't joke, we talk about not flying, not walking into lavatories in socks or bare feet because it's disgusting in there. And it turns out it's really disgusting because Airbus had to put out an AD saying that it can like, there can be a leak and it can corrode through the floorboards and leak into the electronics bay or something like that. Like that, Stuff like this happens on yeah, yeah. all aircraft all the time, and they're constantly fixing them. But Boeing has... Boeing's in the limelight right now. Like and that. Has, for good reason. They've screwed up yeah. plenty. Yeah, no, I'm not I'm not trying to discount, but I think we're, I think it's it's going to be a serious problem for Boeing to come back from, just from a public perception yeah. perspective, because they are... And I don't think people are going to avoid Boeing's, but they're just their... The way they're perceived is flippant, maybe, or... And nonchalant, um, yeah, or just careless. I don't know, uh, but it's I don't yeah. think it's good I, for Boeing. And I agree with you. Most people won't avoid them, but there are some who will. And yeah, I would say Americans not worried, right? They placed that order last week that we talked about for the yep. all the planes um, that may or may not actually get delivered. But yeah, there's there's a lot there. Yeah, um, new United routes. This is fun. Yeah, what do we got? We got uh, more routes for Foz not to get working Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Houston to Medellin. Yep. Right. Um, I'm blanking that. What were the other? Gu- Guam to, or I'm uh, sorry, Narita to Cebu. That's right. That's that's a it's a fun one. Uh, and then we've got uh, the new long haul route, which is uh, is it uh, Newark to um, now I can't think of it. Completely blanked out. I'm sorry. No, it's um, okay. So Cebu, um, is I think the most interesting one. Uh. Newark to Marrakesh. Marrakesh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, also very interesting. But Newark to Cebu, or Narita to Cebu is the super interesting one to me. So this is 
the plane will, it's a 738. It will almost certainly do Guam, Narita, Cebu, and back. Yep. Um, at the local traffic rights on both seg- both segments. And they've timed it to pick up connections from LA, Houston, all the, all the Narita bank, right? Okay. There's, yeah. there's a solid bank at Narita. Uh, I believe it's like a 5 p.m. departure from Narita ish. Okay. Yeah. Right. It'll be a mid afternoon, which now that I think about it, I don't know how they're going to time that right without the plane sitting in Cebu forever, but, uh, I think I think it has to sit overnight. Yeah, I, when it when they first announced that they didn't have it wasn't actually loaded in the schedules. See if I can find it now. Um, it's a it's a very interesting. Uh, yeah, so it's a five thirty departure from Narita lands at ten p.m. Um, and I'm in Cebu, and then the return uh, is not showing up today. They don't show this. You can't search just for the return flight on the United website. No. Cebu Narita, I'm picking random days. It won't show them to me. Maybe I thought it was daily. Um, yeah, it won't show it. Huh. So I'll pull up another schedule. Um, it's it competes. Obviously, having connections is important. But again, this is a seven three eight against uh, three twenty or three twenty one Neo, both from Philippines Airlines and Cebu Pacific. Yep. ANA already code shares on the Philippine Airlines one. It's not clear if this is part of the joint venture that covers. I'm not sure if the joint venture covers Philippines or not. So uh, that may, yeah. I mean, they could they could be doing what what Cebu Pacific is doing and having the two a.m. departure back to Narita. Um, yeah, the time's really weird though because that lands in Tokyo at like eight in the morning, so that you'd yeah. be sitting in Tokyo for you know in Narita Airport for like eight hours. Yeah, the United. This is bizarre. I don't see the United Northbound flight loaded. It's not in uh, Google Flights either. I wonder. Mm-hmm. Do you think they're, it's because they won't sell the one way? Um. For whatever reason, maybe. Let me see if I can find it with the connection onward. Yeah, with the connection, I can find it. So the plane sits for what I say, lands at 10 p.m. Yep. And so it's a 9:30 a.m. northbound to catch the return flights back to the mainland. So the crew will overnight in Cebu. Yeah, yeah, and then I mean, it lands at like 3:15. I mean, that's yeah. kind of, that's a little tight. Nah. The, can you the, st- in transit? No, you still you definitely have to clear security at least. You don't have to clear immigration, but you have to clear you security. security. It's a three two and a half to three hour layer. It's plenty of time in Tokyo. Yeah. 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 True. Um, I think it's, it's the LA flight, which is the one I looked up. But yeah, no, it's, I like that. It's, you know, probably some people, probably some cargo, but remember also United just got their Manila flight up and running. Right. So, yeah. But, but what's your, what's your logic there though? Serve um, more of the Philippines? Serve more of the Philippines, depending on where you need to be. If you need to be on the North side of town, Cebu is way more convenient. Um, and you're connecting anyways. So do you connect in San Francisco or do you connect in Narita? Yeah. Fair enough. I, I'm thinking, like, why not? I don't know why United doesn't push more through Guam. I mean, I guess it's, Cause it's in the, the middle of nowhere. I know, but it, you've got, I don't know. It seems odd to go to yeah. Tokyo. I guess from the East Coast, it makes some sense. But you're not going to, what do you have left? But what do you have from the, what do you have left at Narita? New, Newark, Dulles. Newark, LA, Houston, and Chicago, I believe. And Denver. Denver. Can't forget Denver. De- yeah. Okay, so you have, yeah. decent, you have decent feed. Okay. I mean, that, that makes more sense the more I think about it. But as they draw down Narita, I, I don't know. It feels like Guam makes more sense to serve some of the Oceania, South Pacific. Guam only vaguely makes sense if you're connecting but within the region. If you're trying to get to the mainland because the earth is a funny shade, yeah. you know, roundish, yep. you got to go north to get there. Yeah, but I mean, like Cebu to Guam to San Francisco is much shorter than Cebu to Narita, San Francisco. Is it? I think so. I'm gonna. I'll double check my my math here. So Cebu, Guam, or Cebu, Rita, SFO. Oh. Uh, it's like yeah, 200 it's... miles. 200 miles. Yeah, 100 miles. Yeah. Oh, so it's a little shorter. But it's, no, it's longer. Guam is longer, Stephen. Guam is 7238. Oh, I have them backwards. Yeah. Seven. yeah. Yeah. Guam is really is relatively south, and so to get back to the mainland, you got to go. Yeah, you're, you're already farther south. Yeah, I see what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, to all our listeners, don't at me. Uh, we got it fixed. It's okay. Um, um, so what, do you, what, do you, what do you think, though, like, traffic-wise, this does... I mean, it's a weird usage of a plane. The plane sits overnight. I, I guess the people who fly the Micronesia routes, the, the cruise, yeah. they probably like it because it gives them another destination. Yeah, somewhere else to be. And um, I am a little surprised there's not also a Manila straight to... Excuse me, Guam to Cebu. I could see that sort of joining up, but again, depends on 
what flows are within the region as opposed to back to the mainland. Yeah. And I, you know, the United and Narita has Denver, Newark, Houston, LA, and San Francisco still. They've got a ton of, they've still got five daily mainland flights. So yeah, there's some opportunity there. Cebu is also a very uh, touristy destination, right? Like Cebu is like where you go if you want to go diving and things, correct? Uh, when I went diving, we flew to Manila and went south, but that's where Cebu is. No, she was north. No, Cebu is definitely south of Manila. I'm looking at a map of Manila. Yes, Cebu is like in the center of all of the islands. Oh, right by Leyte. Oh, you know what? I was thinking of Clark. I'm sorry. Yes. So yeah. we we stayed on the mainland and like drove three hours south of Manila into that cove that's sort of on the southwest there. Yeah. Um, but you're no, you're right. I'm sorry. Cebu is island land. Yeah. So I think I think that's part of it too. Is like, oh, you, you pick up some of the Japanese touristy um, folks, and yeah. as well as Americans that want to go to Cebu, uh, you know, via Tokyo. Yeah. Sorry, no, I'm thinking Clark. Uh, which is uh, which they serve Clark, right? They the United no. serves Clark. No. 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 Just the Manila flight. Okay. And now this, um, Marrakesh, three times a week, I think, seasonal for the winter. Mm-hmm. IJ seven six seven, so not a ton of capacity. That's a weird one, man. I could see it doing okay. I mean, as Spaz noted in our chat before we were recording that, you know, they draw down London service. They've got some spare 763s in the winter. Yeah. Um, you know, draw down capacity, whatever. But, uh, so there's some opportunities there. But yeah, that's a, it's an interesting one. They're, they're skipping Casablanca, which, uh, I guess America has it. And obviously Royal Amarok has service to the US. And everyone does, no one, I mean, Casablanca is, I, I mean, Casablanca has tourists, but it's not the touristy. No. Spot, right. No, Marrakesh is. Yeah, for sure. So United is aiming at the right place, in my yeah. opinion. Um, I, I think it's odd. The high J's, I know they got extra sitting around. It's odd that they're not using those on maybe some of the European routes and potentially turning some of those seven, eight, nines to this route. I don't know. Maybe I guess they just look at it lift and they're like, yeah, it's not, we're not, we don't care. But from a cost perspective, I would think running the 763 is fairly expensive. Yeah. I don't know. What, what are your take on that? I, I mean, it's an, it's an expensive plane to operate, but it's, you know, from a gas perspective, but it's paid off at this point. So you've got there. it. Um, I, I think this one has a chance of being successful given less than daily, seasonal, all those things. This is sort of the good things. Um, U.S. China capacity is also picking back up. Yeah, fair enough. So they need those, they need the longer range planes. Um, well, I would change these routes okay, more than that. Oh, but yeah, I guess. Oh, I mean, I, I'm happy. I'm ta- I'm happy to talk about Marrakesh a little bit more. I don't okay. know. I like. I like, we had a good time in Marrakesh. I was. A, I'm a fan. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's good. I think with the 7.63s, you do run the risk of having a mechanical. That's like a, a much higher risk, in my opinion, than yeah any of the other planes. But um, for people who want to go to Morocco, um, I think it's it's a great option. Uh, yeah, I've looked at like Rabat and and Fez uh, mm-hmm. and. Uh, but now I, I guess I have to add Marrakesh to my my wants. Use that as a uh, landing spot and move from there. Exactly. All right. Now tell me. Now tell me about you know, the uh, the China frequencies are coming up uh, are being increased again. So there's mm-hmm. going to be. And I don't know if we talked about this last week. Or not. I vaguely remember it. But uh, United is saying it's going to finally bring LA Shanghai back. If I remember correctly, they're adding it's or one of the Shanghai routes is coming back in like August. Okay. Building to daily by. The October 30th schedule switchover. Yep. Seasonal switchover. And then LA, Hong Kong is going to go double daily, which is surprising to me. But until you can overfly Russia, you can't really do Hong Kong effectively from the East Coast. So if they want capacity, they've got to do it from the West Coast. Do you do you think LA, if Russia airspace, I mean, I asked this question kind of uh, in a chat, but do you think if, if Russian airspace reopens, uh, at least one of the LA, Hong Kong sticks around? Maybe. But I don't know what the volume of the connecting traffic is back to Newark and back to Chicago, which are the yep. two that aren't operating right now that yep. typically would. Um, also kind of depends on, you know, Hong Kong in a lot of ways, right? Hong Kong, we're seeing businesses migrate out of Hong Kong. Like FedEx moved its headquarters to Singapore. There's been a lot of challenges politically there in terms of, you know, tourism is back more or less, but politically to run a business, especially a U.S. business out of Hong Kong is... Not nearly as flexible and easy as it was ten years ago. Yeah, so there's some challenges there. That if if that traffic doesn't return, I could see. I still think you end up with a Newark flight as soon as they can. Yep. Um, maybe Chicago's a little slower to come back, and you keep LA for local, you know, VFR families and leisure mm-hmm. traffic. And obviously, you are competing with triple daily or four daily cafe. cafe but 
Yeah. yeah. Cafe's, right. Cafe's not in no, not doing great these days either. So, and I think that's the, that's the real unknown, right? Like Cafe not doing well is, is probably the thing that would make me think of an LA, Hong Kong on United sticks around at least yeah. one. Um, cause I don't think you want to feed all that traffic through San Francisco. Um, yeah. just, and yeah. again, like, but th- there's the difference of where you're getting the feed. Cafe's feeding from all of Asia, yeah. whereas United is feeding from all the United States. And so is it uh, just some people going to Hong Kong or people passing through? Yeah. And and the other thing, too, we I think someone posted on Twitter or sent us a link on Twitter, like capacity to Africa between Africa and China is now more than China and the United States. So this John, John Ostro over at AirCurrent uh, ah, okay. wrote yeah. that up. It's, yeah. It is accurate. The number of flights... Uh, for the month of April will be higher between China and Africa than China and the United States. That is an accurate uh, observation. Yeah. Um, and you talk about like the recovery is happening much faster than this and that. It was at a much lower level before, and there are artificial impediments to the resumption of the U.S.-China traffic, namely the Russian overflight challenges and diplomatic uh, fights over what, you know, wh- whether whether they can add more flights because the U S the U S airlines don't want Chinese airlines adding more flights that are overflying China because yeah. they can operate them much less expensively. Um, so it, yes, that happened. Yes. China and you, the China to Africa connections, that route is that network is growing. Um, I don't think it's quite as dramatic as that story made it sound, but you know, I'm kind of a jerk that way. Well, and it's going to, it's going to flip, right? Like, um, Eventually, right? Yeah. The, the well, I mean, the U.S. right matter. right now, the U.S. and China have a 35 pa- uh, flights per week cap, and it's going to yep. 50 uh, very soon. The Chinese airlines have already f- been filing all of their updated schedules. It will very quickly go back to the U.S. being in the lead yep. later this year. This is a this is a couple months. I don't say flash in the pan because the Africa stuff isn't going to disappear. Yeah. But this is this is not a systemic inversion of demand. This is. That ch- the African market is going to grow because it was much smaller and there is some demand there and the U.S. market will return to where it was. Maybe the U.S. doesn't return exactly where it was. Maybe the U.S. carriers stop fighting over those slots, but I don't think that it's going to be that. Soft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, and, and and on top of this, like there's some China Southern routes that are coming to Mexico. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, again, there's two ways to look at this politically and businessly, but uh, China Southern is going to fly. Uh, it's filed for Mexico City and Tijuana. Yeah. Uh, so they, and I think it's from Shenzhen. So they'll fly nonstop to Mexico city, uh, three times a week from there, hop down to Tijuana on the border, which is not at altitude. So it has a long enough runway and then they can get, they can make the full flight back to China nonstop without, mm-hmm. uh, from Tijuana. And this is Aero Mexico used to do this for its flights to it Japan that it was running. Yep. Um, it still does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not a unique, new in concept, but it, it is new to see uh, China Southern doing this. And again, this becomes the, is this a shift in the political whatever that says, you know, Mexico is more important than the United States? Probably not. This is also like, there aren't slots available to get into the United States. And for a large number of people, not having to deal with a U.S. transit visa is really nice. Yeah, exactly. So the transit it, visa, I think, is the, the key thing, right? And yeah. For, for folks and for Chinese nationals, I think it's that's even harder, uh, yeah. and and arguably depending on the political climate in the United States, Mexican nationals. So yes, um, so I think yeah, I mean it makes a lot of sense. And if if they're carrying cargo as well, like having people transit the United States to you know with the plane, it, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of asinine. So. so yeah, no, I, I I like this one. I think it's a fun route, um, and I I think there is some good value in overflying the U.S., skipping the U.S. on those trips. So. And, and it coming from it's Shenzhen, so I wonder how much it has to actually do with like maybe it's serving a business purpose, like yeah, with, I, in manufacturing and things like that. I would assume that it's related to manufacturing ties. I know like that because of the NAFTA stuff and whatever, there is a certain amount of Chinese supported manufacturing in the United States in Mexico that feeds U.S. markets, but does it tariff free? Yeah, exactly. That they can't that they'd face significant tariffs from China if they yeah. shipped across the ocean. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool line. Cool line. Um, so I think that's a show. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, EVs. We're going to talk about self-service TSA and uh, some Airbnb changes uh, in the bonus topics for our Patreon subscribers. Um, so if you're not a subscriber, uh, you should sign up to listen to that or not. Uh, but we thank you for listening and uh, we thank you for supporting the show. And we'll talk to you next time. Happy travels. Take care.
And we're back for our Patreon supporters with lots of things to complain about. I'm not going to complain. I'm not complaining. What am I you should. about? Why? Because sure. you had a shitty experience. I mean, it was a mediocre experience. I'll put it that way. I, I got an EV. Uh, Anything less than an 8 or a 9 or a 10 on your uh, net promoter score is a bad experience, dude. And we strive for excellence here. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I got an EV. I wrote, I did a whole write-up. We'll put the link in the show yeah. notes um, about you know my experience. But it Orlando Airport, got an EV. Um, they basically said, this is what I have. And there was a bomb threat going on. And I didn't really want to sit around and wait for a different car. So I took it. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me um so a few things one uh it was it was 40 percent charged when i picked it up which meant 100 miles of range i think that's ridiculous i think um if you can't support the ev the evs that you have by charging them for 30 minutes with a fast charger you probably shouldn't have evs on the way yeah. that's that's my opinion um if i had wanted to go somewhere i would have immediately had to go to a charging station uh, and, and then the, just the overall communication of like, Hey, this is how you should charge it. Or just some kind of like starter guide from the rental facility would be nice. Yeah. I think some, some people have said other rental companies do have that. I think Hertz maybe has like a quick start guide or something. Um, you get an email from Hertz if they know that's what you booked, but you didn't book that. So I'm not sure you would have gotten it. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't have gotten it. So, um, I think that was, and, and I asked the question, I said, like, how much do I have to charge this before returning it? And the guy was like 70% of what it's at now, which I'm like, well, that would have been like, you know, 25, 30% maybe of charge. Like that's, yeah, that's not great. Um, and, and there's nowhere documented on like the slip that they give you for rental or in the email or whatever of what the actual charge is. It just said eight out of eight full because it's not a gas vehicle. So using eights to describe how full the car is, is probably wrong. Um, and then finding a charger is not as easy as people make it seem. I, it's easy in quotes, but knowing what that charger can do as someone who doesn't own an EV is limiting. Yeah. Because I didn't get a fast charger. It took half the day to charge the car. Um, and you said it wasn't right at your work, right? No, I had to walk 15 minutes. So there's nothing at the Orlando convention center, the, the, uh, Ontario, is it Ontario County? What's the County that it's in? Yeah. It's not uh, Ontario. uh, whatever that convention center is there or orange. Uh, orange county yeah i knew it was california name that i was thinking of. Uh, uh orange county convention center there's no there's four ev chargers but two of them were broken and two of them were occupied every day i was there so it's not many yeah it's not a lot for a huge convention center especially in a convention that was about electricity so um <laughs> anyway just uh, i think the overall experience like at least give me something like the one i think the car rental car facilities need to the rental car companies need to focus on a car a specific vehicle type like yeah g- give me if, if it's all hondas that's fine but ha- work with hondai to program these things that have chargers ready to go in the app so i can just go click find a charger here's the closest one here's how this works you know and here's yeah. the fast chargers or whatever so that it's easy and this should be so- this is software right it's shouldn't be hard yeah um I'm- yeah go ahead no, I'm looking at the email. So I actually had a Hertz EV booked a couple weeks ago um, when I was in Ontario, of all places. I was supposed to rent a car and drive downtown. And then I was going to have some meetings. The meeting scrubbed. So I just took the train instead, which was wonderful and convenient. But they do send you an email. There's a whole like landing page microsite for the EVs. They give you a trip planner, route planner thing yeah, to help you figure out where you're going to go and where chargers might be. But you, um, And they charge a flat rate for recharging. That's or nice. you can Oh, yeah, it's $35, $25 for Gold Plus Rewards members or return at the same charge level it had it picked up. Um, You know, so those are some, you know, a few things. But again, like also the last time I rented one, this time I didn't. And this time I had, I think, a Polestar or something booked. But the first time I did, I did with a Tesla and Tesla moves enough of the buttons around. Yep. Like I didn't actually know how to operate the vehicle, having been a driver for legally uh, a driver for almost 30 years. Yeah. Um, so that was, again, a, a thing. And I, you know, some of that stuff is in the videos, maybe, but like, I don't also plan to do research at that level. Like, ha- how do I shift it into gear? Yeah. And oh, by the way, I don't know if you saw the story about how. Uh, yeah. So the woman was killed because she couldn't get the door open. Door open. Yeah. 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 It, Which I think it, it, it shifted into reverse instead of forward or vice versa. And she yeah. couldn't figure out what was going on and died. The, the, yeah. A billionaire sister in law of. Uh, Mitch McConnell, yeah, and sister of the former Secretary of Transportation, yeah, yep. oops, 
I, I, yeah, I mean, I think like this car, it was fairly straightforward. Single pedal yeah. driving does take some getting used to. Um, but I think again, this comes back to like models being so different and it takes time and a rental car is not the place to learn some of this stuff in my, in my opinion. Right. I, I generally agree with you with the caveat that I also, you know, would rather destroy a rental car than my own or something about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I know. But I think like, I agree. like when you're wanting to get on the road, it's like, I don't want to spend 30 minutes trying to figure out how this thing works. Like, it's just not. So I did like a loop around the parking lot and that's how I kind of got the feel for it, which was kind of terrifying because I was like surrounded by other vehicles, but it yeah. was, was fine. It gave me a feel for like single pedal driving, you know, oh, I'm going to let off as soon as I let off the gas, it's braking. Um, right. So just getting that feel. And I don't think I ever really got super comfortable with the single pedal driving i wasn't in like super confident mode but i was better like knowing oh just let off the pedal a little bit don't don't fully let your foot off because it'll break just let your foot off you know yeah. ease up um yeah apparently at least like on the teslas that's the regenerator regenerative braking you can turn that off and on so yeah and i bet you could hear but again i didn't i gotta right. go into the menus and figure out how to do you know and i'm yeah. sure and I, I actually after the after the fact i went in and looked like a mercedes uh eqb is what i had um and looked up their, you know, app and everything that they have. And their app actually looks like something that would be very useful as an EV owner, right? Yes. Yeah. It was like, oh, here's their charging stations. Here's, you know, you can set the car to only charge to 75% or, you know, you can only look, you know, it just all those things that you make life easier um, for, for an owner. But yeah, it makes you wonder if the rental agency should try to find a way to white label that bundle it into app. their app, right? Yeah. Okay. You got, you know, here's your Avis app. You, this is your car. Here's yep. the information you need to manage it. Obviously, there's a lot of complexity around security and stuff to make that work. But yep. after and I, don't, I think all of this to say, I don't think I would hesitate to rent another EV. Um, I don't know that I would do it in Orlando again. Yeah. But EV charging situation seems very Tesla focused um, there. I, I know that there's others, but yeah. it's much more spread out. Um, but other places, I don't I don't think I would I would have problem at all. Yeah, I, I would only hesitate to rent a Tesla at this point just because safety. I don't feel safe in them. I, I mean, overall, do you did you enjoy? If it was not a Tesla, did you enjoy? You didn't get to drive the Polestar, but did you enjoy the EVs? It was fine. Like it, it's different driving, and yeah. so figuring that out, like you said, on a rental is a bad time to sort that out. I was fortunate that I did it back when you didn't have to re- recharge to return. It yeah. was early enough in the era, and it was fully charged, and I was able to do my Southern California adventure without needing to charge. Yeah, uh, but. So, yes, it was fine, but also, like, it's different, and that's, I'm sure next time we have to get a new car, it will be an electric vehicle. Uh, I hope that's not for 10 years yet, but um, it's going to happen, and I will learn, and it will be fine. But in the meantime, it is a weird and different experience, and it's it's not just the difference between driving, like, a micro car, you know, super compact and a sedan boat. No, it's, it's, there's a lot of difference that goes into it. Yeah, and and the, I think it's quiet. It's quiet, like it's unbelievably yeah. quiet, which is the first thing I noticed. But I think for people, if you're on the fence about an EV or you you have doubts, just rent one from a. I mean, it's actually really cheap to rent cars these days, so just rent an EV and drive it for the day and see what you think. Like, yeah, yeah go go charge it, see what it's like. Um, I I it's to me it seems worth it just to get an idea of what the driving experience is. So yeah, um, self service TSA. Yeah, I hate this idea. <laughs> I just this makes me cringe like a lot. Well, I mean, the staffing is not great either, so we're running out of options. Fair enough. I mean, I think you're right. Okay, so let's let's give some context here. The TSA is trialing a program for pre-check travelers, where they go through a kind of self-service uh, way of of being screened. So you, I think you show your ID or you scan the ID at a machine and it looks and it compares your face. Mm-hmm. And then you put your bag on the baggage carousel or whatever, and you go through, and then it's got a body scanner, which I don't understand how that works with, because pre-check's not supposed to have the body scanner. Um, and then it tells you, you know, oh, you're clear, or you've got something in your left pocket or whatever. So, yeah. I mean, it's right, all it's basically the, I know how to do it. I don't need all these people yelling at me. Just let me do it. Okay, prove it, buddy. Um, yeah. In a lot of ways. The facial recognition slash ID scanner thing is has been under development and under deployment, has been deployed for a while, now, right? My checkpoints in Boston are all facial recognition now and have been for a while. Um, there's a scan the ID version of it. Uh, there's also, I want to say Delta and United. United's at LAX, Delta, maybe at LaGuardia and a couple other places. They're trialing a enroll your ID before departure, like 
I don't know if it's a scan or a whatever in the app. And then you can show a QR code or NFC because everything's all on your phone now. You don't have to have a separate ID out. So like the scan, the facial recognition happens against that. Yeah. Um, it's still not completely seamless, but they're trying to take the having to show the ID at all out of the to a person out of the you have to show yeah. your phone still. But they're trying to take yep. that out of the loop. Um, so like part of that is this is just an incremental on that. But then there's also the I don't know there's other bits that are the self, you know, getting myself through the baggage part. I think I could probably handle that. I generally don't need help from someone unless like there's no bins around or I need a little bit the bowl or something. But figuring out how they're going to manage people walking through who alarm the walkthrough part all the time. That's well, it's also it, what do you think of the body scanner? Because we haven't like the body scanners are there, but it's it's really only there if you have like a hip, you know, a, a fake hip or a fake yeah. knee, you know, um, I, I tend to avoid them. It's slower. It, I don't particularly like the experience. Um, well, and so how do you opt out? Like I, that doesn't that with doesn't, this. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. And I, I just see this being I, I, I still go through security with pre-check people who have no idea what they're doing. And I'm yes. like, how did, how did you ever get pre- how have you ever flown? Have you ever been to an airport? That's my, yeah, you know, Monday morning, roll my eyes. Oh, I need to have my ID out. Yeah, what do you what do you think we're doing? I could, Listen, man, I got that fancy credit card that they told me to get that I could get the free pre check, so I did it. Okay, and I have no idea what it does. I I have no idea what I'm doing at the airport. I don't even know where I'm going. Uh, that's how I feel. Yes. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm not I'm not a fan. We'll see how this goes in in. Vegas, but I don't think yeah. it's going to go well. Uh, lastly, Airbnb is going to ban indoor security cameras. It's like, well, that took long enough. Yeah, it's one of those things you want to be like, oh, that was... You think they were allowed? Yeah, they, and so I have seen this a number of... I, I use Airbnb still a surprising amount. Um, and definitely have seen the, oh, hey, you know, one-star review, there was a security camera inside. Yeah. Cre- you know, creepy. Um, yeah, creepy. I, I sort of get not wanting your house to be destroyed, but like, welcome to running an illegal hotel. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you can get security cameras in hotel rooms too. We've seen those stories right in the past. Um, I, I just don't know how to deal with it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, so we see the stories of cameras in hotel rooms. It's, it's, it's a risk. Also, definitely sketchy. Yeah, exactly. So, no, I think I think I definitely think it's sketchy. I just it's surprising like this is like a one, it's a news story, and two, like Airbnb's like, Yeah, we're doing a good thing. It's like I mean, you should have done this a while back, I guess. Like Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm still we stay in some vacation rentals, some of them are Airbnb, some of them are other things. Uh I'm always a little I, I don't love it. Uh right. I don't know. And then uh, what do you think about Vacasa? It sounds like they're kind of just dying slowly. Who? Vacasa, which I don't know if you even have that where you're at. But it's a yeah, that's one I'm not familiar with. It's I a Portland uh, vacation company, um, like house. Yeah, and it, it it feels like they're maybe um, that maybe they're it's the end yeah. for them. I've used VRBO before. I mean, the real problem is that there's scant few independent people renting out a random room or whatever anymore. It's people who have multiple properties and are managing them as illegal hotels, and they have often third party systems that let them tap into the bigger platforms to put pricing out and so and manage you know scheduling so if someone books a vrbo it gets immediately removed from airbnb also kind of thing yeah. and so yep. uh that's a that's where the bulk of the inventory is and so if you're a random you know it goes back to our how big do you have to be as a company if you're a random one-off whatever like can you have enough properties in your inventory and generate enough traffic to justify developing the software and maintaining a staff to support it and true yeah yeah um, yeah there's a lot of money there right yeah there's a lot of money involved a lot, of, a lot of expense. Airport Council International top airports uh, award is out. Came out. Who, who won? Uh, Casablanca in Africa across all five departure categories, maximizing a pleasant experience at every stage of the airport journey. Yogyakarta in uh, Asia, Izmir and Rome, Fumicino in Europe. Fumicino. Fu- wait, wait. Fumicino won. <laughs> ah, I would wonder if you'd let me get through it. Yeah. No, th- that's how you know this list is bullshit. Uh, who was you know while the customer survey? Who did they survey? People who don't like airports, and they're like, "Oh, this one was mediocre, so I'll give it." A, I, like, how do you? It's a terrible airport. Huh. On that note, anyway, I'm okay. to dispute that. <laughs> uh, all right, listeners, we got go. we got to go. Thank you, Patreon subscribers, for supporting our show. Uh, we appreciate it, and we appreciate you listening. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>